Hello and welcome to this BIA webinar on how to communicate your R&D to investors and the wider public. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, before I hand over to Sue, who will be chairing today, um, your mics are muted, uh, but you can type in questions at any point throughout the webinar, and then I will read them out to our panel and we'll try and answer them. Um, if we don't get round to asking your question, we'll be doing a Q&A afterwards that will be uploaded onto the BIA blog. This webinar will also be recorded and put onto our YouTube channel. So, uh, over to you, Sue. Thank you very much, Martin. Well, welcome to everyone who's on the line. Um, we have in the room uh, three expert panelists who are going to say uh, a little about themselves in a minute. Um, they represent uh, the um, investment community, um, analysts, and in-house communications. Um, I'm Sue Charles, and I work at um, a communications consultancy. So between us, we cover the waterfront of opinion. Um, sadly, we don't have today um, the um, editor of the BMJ who was going to join us, um, but hopefully we can represent opinions in the room. So can I kick off by perhaps asking each of you, um, starting with Bruff, to introduce yourself and, and really the opinions that you're trying to bring to the panel today? Sure. So I'm Bruff Ransom, uh, and I work at uh, M Plus One Singer. I've been a healthcare specialist salesman for the past 20 years, uh, raising money for quite a lot of biotech companies in that time, and uh, obviously uh, working in the market and uh, trading with stock uh, all the time. Uh, my principal interest in this is obviously clear communication and uh, how prices and how the traders react uh, to uh, communication, and that it's as clear as possible for them uh, as one audience. Uh, on to various other audiences. Thank you very much. Liz, as an analyst turned investor, perhaps you'd like to comment. <laughs> My name's Liz Klein. I'm an investment consultant with Biosciences Managers, as well as consulting with the BIA on their investor um, relationships. Um, I've been an, I was an investment analyst for 15 years, um, always looking at small and mid-cap life sciences and helping uh, the flow of information from one group, the companies, to the investors. That's what I believe is key about this communications guide that the BIA has produced. It's about how helping to clearly communicate um, across the spectrum from, from the companies and make sure those investors understand it. Thanks, Liz. Chris, your, your in-house perspective. Thanks, Sue. Uh, so my name is Chris Sampson, and uh, yeah, representing in-house. Right now, I'm in-house with a company called BTG, where I'm the head of corporate communications. Uh, BTG, for folks who aren't familiar, is a mid-size uh, medtech and pharmaceutical company uh, based here in London. Um, prior to that, I've been with BTG about three years. Prior to that, I was with AstraZeneca for uh, close to 10 years and spent three or four of those years in their media relations team. Um, and notably, it was a period of three or four years where I think we had three, I think I worked under three different CEOs. So I've seen a range of disclosure committees, seen them running in slightly different ways, and hopefully can bring some of that perspective to the table. Um, and just some of the, I think, practical considerations and motivations of an in-house team as you're trying to put these things together. Great. Thank you. Well, perhaps if I can kick off by just setting the, the uh, scene for the guide. Um, the BIA... Um, originally produced a guide back in 2001, which feels a very long time ago now, I remember it well, um, and updated it in 2006. And I think everyone is probably aware of the changes in um, the external environment since 2001 and 2006, um, in terms of the speed of communication, social media, changes in clinical trial practice, etc. So it was deemed now was a good time to um, really consult with the industry, consult with the recipients of communications, and formulate what we hope has, um, is a clear but relatively brief guide to best communications. So it, it, it's a guide, it's not a, a code of conduct, and we hope that um, uh, everyone will find it helpful. Um, and the idea of this workshop today is really to um, expand on that and explore you know, perhaps a few areas of clarity or a few areas where um, if you don't get it right, um, you know, the consequences of that. So that's the background to the guide. Um, uh, colleagues from Concilium and Simmons and Simmons kindly worked with myself and the BIA to um, do a lot of the heavy lifting to pull things together, which Martin very kindly 
and finally wrote, so thank you, Martin. Um, and we did, part of the process over a six-month period, consults with quite a wide number of audiences. So we had a, a panel of attendees from uh, communications and the analyst community. We met with the BMJ to understand from a publishing perspective. Um, you know, a lot of life sciences gets reported in, in data publications, so that was pretty important to understand the, the publishing background. We met with a clinical trial expert who explained perhaps some of the changes to clinical trial practice. Um, and we also met with the LSE and the um, Financial uh, Conduct Authority. So we tried to bring all of that together in what we've produced in the final guide. The final guide really, um, perhaps pages six and seven are a summary of our thinking in the guide for anyone who's already looked at it, which are really four um, hopefully simple pro um, principles that we thought that would be the best way of exploring the workshop today to look at those four principles, um, which are uh, well prepared. Um, and many of these sound very obvious, but actually when you dig down into them, there's lots of ways you can trip up that perhaps companies haven't thought about. So well prepared, um, consistent, fair, balanced, balanced and understandable, i.e. clear, um, and mindful of the members of the public um, with whom uh, communications may have impact. And I think that's particularly important these days. I think we've all seen a more patient-centric environment in everything that we do. Um, and with online communication being so rapid these days, you really have to think about impact on those final um, patients that we're all trying so hard to deliver drugs and therapies and technologies to serve. So that's the, the sort of four principles. So before we get started on that, um, I thought we'd kick off by asking uh, each member of the, um, the panel, um, perhaps if they could highlight you know, a relatively recent example of, of good communication just to set the scene. So uh, Chris, if I could um, ask you if you can, uh, you can mention BTG or, or another company of where you- Oh, I wouldn't do that. And, uh, <laughs> very self-serving if I did that, I think. Yeah. One of the I was going to pick was um, was the GW Pharma uh, example. They had a uh, phase two A study that, that failed to meet its endpoint, um, and and it, it's uh, it's probably awkward to be starting on bad news. But I think this is often where uh, the communication doesn't go to plan or or can sometimes become misleading, uh, and that wasn't at all the case here. I think um, GW did a, a was very clear about having missed that endpoint and. The reason I think it's a useful example is uh, their headline is actually quite neutral. It just described it, announcing the results of, you know, they went on to describe the study. Uh, but they put a subhead in that explained that it had missed the, the, the endpoint, and the first sentence very clearly explained that they had missed the endpoint. And I think, um, I can bring a kind of internal perspective to this, it can be very uncomfortable to put missed endpoint in the headline, and I can understand, even though the jurist and some of the investors would love to have it there. Um, if you can't bring yourself to do that, I think what GW did was great in terms of um, putting it right in that subhead in the first sentence and, rather than burying it um, much deeper in the release as we've seen some others do. Yeah, good. No, I think that's a, a good example of uh, honesty and clarity um, in the communication. So, Bruff, is there any, any um, positive or negative um, announcement that comes to mind as a good example? I'm sure I'm going to do a negative one as well. Okay. But, um, but, it, but these are the hardest things. But it, exactly, exactly. And I think um, the one I would actually um, sing is probably Sarcassia, um where you know, there was a uh, missed primary endpoint in the allergy study, um, and actually it effectively stopped them being an allergy company at all by the time uh, everything was said and done. Um, and they have transitioned themselves over to uh, asthma um, and COPD successfully. So it's interesting... Uh, from our point of view, they did manage to get it right up in the, either in the title or in the first sentence, as you said, and um, it was very, very clear. Uh, there was no attempt to dodge it or say that the subgroup mm -hmm. has performed well or whatever. Yep. No, it, it, it's not going to work. Good. All right. Thank you. Liz, any examples uh, that you'd like to highlight? Actually, uh, I'm going to highlight a, something that's not, obviously not in the small and mid-cap space and is a positive example. That's Sanofi Genzyme on the recent Rare Disease Day. They engaged uh, across the whole world. They they had events in pretty much every country you could think of. They highlighted their positive work across rare diseases and, and uh, their longevity around those diseases. I just thought the the, the global 
response and the globalness of what they were doing uh, really highlighted the impact of the rare disease piece that's quite an important part of that of their business. And plays very much to the patient engagement part of it, so thank you for that. Um, and I think if I could throw in an example um, uh, of uh, Aztecs that these days isn't a listed company, um, it's owned by Otsuka, but last year a, a, a drug that it has been instrumental in helping to discover as part of a collaboration with Novartis um, actually reached the market. And I think um, Aztecs could have taken the opportunity of just announcing it had received a milestone. It actually used the opportunity to try and communicate around British science and the strength of British science and that perhaps you don't have to be a company listed on the London Stock Exchange to be a British success story. Um, it's, uh, it employs a lot of people in Cambridge. And, and I think that was just a good good way of again, um, to bring the positive news out, um, uh, you know, whilst not pretending that that it was anything that it wasn't, but it was a sort of discovery success story for, for, for British science. So that, that's one I think was, was good as well. So um, so I think we're not here to name and shame. That's not the purpose of um, either the guide or, or this webinar. Um, but there are consequences, I think, of poor communication. So um, without necessarily dwelling on negative examples, um, then perhaps Chris, um, or, or Russ, perhaps you'd like to go first in talking about what, what are the communications consequences of poor communications? Can you can you elaborate on that, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, sorry, do you, you want to? Well, I was just going to say that was, um, an interesting exercise last night, actually. I was thinking about, um, you know, we were just talking about the examples of recent announcements that were good and bad. And this issue of the endpoint is always kind of... Uh, uh, a touchy one, I think. That's it's it's the real it's real crucible for for good communications. And so, I did a quick search of the RNS system to some keywords like missed primary endpoint <laughs> just to see, you know, how often does it head, hit the headline, and you know, where do people put it? Looking for for good and bad examples. Uh, and I did the same search of I think one newswires, PR newswire, to see if anything came up, and it, quite a few do come up. But then I did a search of Google News headlines. It comes up an awful lot there, you know, and it comes up in the headline, not the first paragraph, right? So I think in terms of consequences, you sort of have to accept that regardless of how you position this in the press release, you know, the truth is the truth, right? And you're, you're probably much better off being being honest about it, and Barack could probably speak better to, to why that is. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'm, I'm, the easiest way for me to do it is to sort of paint a bit of a picture. I mean, when uh, once it come out, it comes out at 7 o'clock in the morning, um, and there is a variety of audiences even in one particular place. So um, I, I, as a specialist salesman, uh, me and my analysts are normally trying to interpret what has been said. Um, sometimes we need to do more interpretation than at other times. It depends on the release. And... Um, we're talking to an audience that consists of traders, sales traders, salesmen, institutions, and effectively, although we don't talk to the retail base, what is communicated through us and, and what, what our traders do with the price is going to get out there one way or the other. Um, so there are two bits of things I'd, I'd say. One is, um, you know, I've, I've got to be able to put it into a one-word answer for my traders, you know, up, down, or unch, or unchanged. Um, I've got to get it into uh, a sentence for my sales traders, a paragraph for my salesmen, and then be anything from a paragraph to a, quite a long conversation with, with the institutional shareholders. So there are different audiences that need different level of detail. Um, and also you have to think about the shelf life of an RNS or, or an announcement as well. So I see it at seven o'clock in the morning, but there will obviously be retail shareholders who won't sit till nine, nine thirty. And what you've got to make absolutely sure is that the level of accuracy remains from the first point it's released to, to when people see it. And, and then what they probably see first, mm -hmm. to be frank, is a share price reaction, and then they go around looking for why. So uh, that's worth bearing in mind. Um, I think that uh, in terms of sort of quality, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, a sort of a poor announcement, it, it basically puts everyone's teeth on edge, and, and you sort of know that if you if something isn't clear, you're going to have to do an awful lot of digging, and it's may, a makes the company very unpopular, frankly, for the <laughs> amount of effort. Mm -hmm. Because do remember, again, you know, this is uh, this for the company might be their baby. They spent days crafting this. They've been analysing the data. Scientists have been poring over this. You know, for us, this could be one of you know 50 announcements that day. 
some of which are seen as considerably more important because they're for bigger companies or they're for, you know, they have more profound effect on the stock price. So do get yourselves in context um, and also you know, be aware that there will be a price volatility on this uh, and you may be un unduly and harshly punished for, for not getting things out in the open. Funnily enough, actually, if you put things out that, um, that are pretty clear, you might see a, a drop in the morning uh, or, or a drop over the sort of first half hour of trading that's actually, you know, mitigated by what you put lower down in terms of, well, okay, but there were subgroups within this, you know, that we need to look at further. There are um, racial types that um, react well to this. Um, I'm thinking of, sort of an AstraZeneca drug years ago that worked very well on the Japanese, for example. And so there's, there's lots of things that can be put into an announcement lower down, just get the top part, part right. And that's another bit I would talk about, um, I think I'm going to talk about later, is, is, is how one layers that. Yeah, thank you. And I think that brings out the point that, again, we might touch on later of, of people receiving releases are not sort of in-depth, everyday, living and breathing um, your drug or, or your innovation. So terminology and and those sort of things is really important. You know, don't don't assume that everyone knows what ALS is. You need to spell these things out. You need to be consistent between releases in that in those terminologies. So it's very easy to just follow the words. I mean, when we're um, giving people advice on on uh, pr presentations generally, we tell them, you know, if you want to get technical, put it in the appendix. There's no harm there. If someone needs to know, they can flick back through it and find it. And that's mm -hmm. the same with the releases. If you put it at the bottom of the release, the people who need to find it will find it. Yeah. Perfect. That's a good piece of advice there. So, all right. Shall we move on um, to um, discussing the four principles then? And hopefully that will bring out a lot of other points. Just a reminder to the audience, um, you do have the opportunity to pose questions. So um, <coughs> what we are going to do is go through each of the four principles. Um, and then, Martin, if there are any questions that really pertain to that principle, um, we can pop them in at that point uh, and hopefully address questions as we go along. So, um, so first off, then, Dib Dib, be prepared. Um, uh, who's got a scouting background and would like to, uh, to discuss the, the well prepared? Chris, perhaps you'd like to say this one. Yeah, I was uh, I was a Boy Scout when I was a lot of times, a long time ago. I don't think I ever got a merit badge for press releases, but um, I should have. Um, there's a quote I, I love on, on preparation. There's a couple of quotes I love, but I'll give you one. And um, for a long time, I, um, I've attributed it to Churchill, I think, because I think everything was Churchill. But it was uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, one of my countrymen, former president and uh, an army general. And he said, plans are useless, but planning is valuable. And I think that's a pretty good way to capture how I feel about preparing for news announcements. Um, you know, whatever your plan happens to be, it, it's not uncommon that when you actually see the data and the complexity of the data and you start to uh, look, look at it more closely uh, and, and see some of the, the, the drivers of that data, um, that things are going to change. But, I, you know, I, I would hate for people to see that as an excuse not to do the preparation. I think it's very easy to think to yourself, well, if I scenario plan and war game each of these, there's 50 different things that could happen. So we're just not going to do it. But I think just to, to do a few of those is um, is an invaluable exercise. So there's your, you know, there's your sort of positive and negative. But uh, I think if you pick one or two of the likely mixed scenarios, it, it'll just give people a, a in, internally a, a sense of what some of the considerations are. And I think to not be seeing those for the first time when you're actually looking at your your, your unlocked data is, uh, is very useful. Um, and I, I think there's also in my experience, you can be very prepared as a business for how you're going to handle certain news, but there's um, there's something about putting that down on paper that tends to sharpen the mind. Um, and I think when people may have their own perspective on how what, what something means or what the, the, the next steps are going to be, etc., um, doing this sort of scenario planning of your press release helps to get everybody aligned. I mean, I say press release, but of course that becomes your you know, your core document, a core set of messages that then get used in a variety of ways and tailored for, for a variety of different audiences, but are, are largely consistent with that. I think the other thing I wanted to the other point to make was just in, in very practical terms, um, good reasons to, to, to do this um, preparation or planning is in many cases, depending on how important this news is to you, it's going to be material information. So you're going to have a, a very narrow window of time in which to do all this work. And um, depending on what kind of resource you have to throw at it, um, that time 
you know, the time you might not have, you might not have the time to do it as well or as broadly as you'd like. And so the preparation scenario plans help give you a bit of a jump start there. And it also helps, I think, you to get a wider range of input. So again, in a material disclosure situation, you'll have some sort of insider list. You're trying to keep the number of people involved to an absolute minimum. Um, and that might tie your hands in terms of asking somebody in the field or asking your patient group or asking certain outside advisors uh, for their opinions, whereas if you're working from um, scenario plans and, and hypotheticals and you genuinely don't have the data, you've got a lot more freedom to collect that input from a from a broad range of, of audiences. So, um, yeah, I mean, how, how how much time do you spend on this? How long is a piece of string? But yeah. I, I just think it's 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 well worth. Um, there's a lot of advantages to doing it. Thank you. And perhaps um, as BMJ um, editor couldn't be here today, I might want to throw in um, some views that we gathered very usefully, I think, from the consultation with her. Um, obviously, when you first um, might announce data, the, the company's in control, you know when you're going to unblind the data, et cetera. I think you have to consider, um, uh, and this is what came out with the BMJ, situations where the company itself may not be in control of the actual embargo and, and the point at which the, the news lifts. So I think two obvious um, situations there are when you are submitting um, your data for publication and at that point you pass the rights to um, determining timing and the embargo for that information over to the publication that you are submitting your data to. Um, so you really need to be prepared then and clearly understand what their processes are and particularly these days, changing processes. So just to highlight um, to, to the audience listening in, um, you know, in the old days, you had nice print versions of journals and they came out on a particular day and you put them on the newsstand or you got them through your letterbox. These days, um, with online publications, there are two or three points at which data that you've submitted may appear in the public domain. Um, and that's not only the online publication of the final version of, of the manuscript before it appears maybe in print, but there is a trend now to um, putting a draft version for comments. So it's not even final, it hasn't received final review online. And I think understanding, um, and this was something that the BMJ highlighted, was changing very quickly. And in fact, for their publications, will change over the course of the next 12 months. Um, and I know Nature and others are the same. So uh, I think a good tip is, Anytime you've submitted your data to a publication, really be aware of what their processes are. You do not want to be caught out by data appearing in a draft version online when you haven't prepared for it. So that's one. I think the other is conferences when you submit your uh, publications um, or a poster or a presentation. Um, you will you will know what the intended um, dates of disclosure for those conferences are. Um, but I think quite a few companies got caught out last year when ASCO accidentally posted um, abstracts ahead of when they should have. Um, so I think those companies that were prepared, had um, considered, had got their press release ready to go, were, were able to respond quickly to that. Um, and those companies who hadn't yet and had left it to the last 24 hours before preparing their releases didn't manage so well. So again, I think preparedness in the sight of other people's actions is, is really important. So. Um, so b before we move on, um, Liz or Bruff, did you have um, anything that you wanted to, to comment on in the, the Be Prepared? Yes, I was just going to talk about when things slightly go, go slightly wrong because maybe the whole internal process isn't clearly understood by everybody. So for instance, um, an example of hemogenics, February the 25th, somebody tweeted that there was a serious breakthrough in the lab. Um, obviously the share price moved and the next day the company released a, a statement which was obviously more detailed uh, uh, sought through um, R&S but at the top they had to talk about the share price movement now that was unfortunate um, but it really makes it clear that you have to have control of every news outlet within the business and make sure that everybody within your business even you know, the person who's running the Twitter feed, who might be somebody who is not in the communications team, understands what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate to release. Because that that causes an issue for everybody and it's not the way any company wants to be releasing its news um, when there's when there's 
uh, you know, no, no ability to control it. Yes, so I think that's uh, protocols, processes, etc., are, are critical, really. And perhaps we'll, we'll touch on that again later with with social media, because I think I've, I've certainly seen examples as well of where companies have very tight procedures for their RNS and their formal releases, but have not quite considered all of the um, social media um, uh, consequences and pr processes. So, Ruff, did you have anything else before? Yeah, no, what I was going to say is to Chris's point about wargaming, etc., and trying to um, be as well prepared as possible. Obviously, you can bring um, a an analyst over the wall earlier, mm -hmm. and um, it's always helpful to have a sort of third party and outside voice commenting on things and, and providing a bit of, well, actually, it's not going to be that reaction, it's going to be this one, yeah. whatever. Um, it's always helpful to have another pair of eyes and also have them well prepared yep. for the next morning. Yes, yes. I mean, because I think you need third parties um, uh, available to comment on it's not just the company's comments, but patient groups and, yeah, and analysts and, and even the BIA on occasions. I think, you know, I've certainly, um, where we know there's going to be something that might impact the whole sector, it's, it's well worth, um, you know, um, uh, making sure that the BIA is well informed as well, obviously not as an insider, but, but just well informed and, and prepared. So, Okay, um, we don't seem to have any questions at this point from, from the audience on be prepared. Um, hopefully we've covered everything you might want to hear. So let's move on then to the consistency point. Um, Liz, I know it's a bugbear of yours when companies aren't yes. consistent, so uh, <laughs> perhaps you'd like to elaborate. Yes, I, certainly over the years, uh, having spent 15 plus years as an investment analyst, I saw a number of companies that these endpoints slightly changed over from one release to the other. What were they looking for um, might not be have been clearly stated um, so that they could get a more positive outcome from a press release. Um, also, remember, as, as Bruff said, there might be 50, 60 news announcements that the traders have to take into account over over a, a half an hour period between 7.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. when the market's open. So if you put in a huge amount of jargon, it's extremely difficult for anybody to interpret that and clearly communicate that. And you can't expect everybody to know that uh, IBD means irritable bowel syndrome or what ALS means or what, uh, you know, or what any of these pieces of jargon that you, that, people within the industry use all the time um, and and remind people what your business does and where you're going. So if you've got a tagline that your business is a, you know, an allergy specialist but or a respiratory specialist, be consistent about how you present your business because at 7 a.m. Um, there's a lot to look at and a lot to go through. Uh, and but remember, be consistent from one release to another. And I think that's a really good point. I, I certainly get occasional pushback from clients who feel perhaps they're just being too repetitive um, and want to describe something in a different and more exciting way because, well, we said it that way last time, let's you know find a different way. And actually, that, that isn't helpful. I we think. like repetition. Yeah, you know, um, say, it, say it and say it again. And I think, you know, it's then clear, it's obvious, and, and that consistency from release to release in how you describe things is, is important. It's not repetitive, actually, it's consistency. And, and the other point to bring out is be consistent about what your next steps are. Very good point. Very clear that uh, you've had a successful phase one, the next step is a phase two, and that's going to be happening in H2. Uh, or if that has changed for some reason, explain that that has changed. You don't necessarily have to explain in huge detail, but you might say these results from this trial mean that we can accelerate the phase two trial. That will now be in Q3 over Q4. Uh, so that people can clearly benchmark what they're doing. Um, but those next steps can be critically important in how people interpret your news release and whether or not they see it as a positive or negative yeah. um, outcome for the share price. Yeah, I think you, you really can't underestimate how much scrutiny those differences will be given, right? Mm -hmm. I think if you're changing a timeline, that's a, a clear one. But even the language you use to describe something, like people are going to look at these releases side by side, yep. and they're going to read into, interpret, perhaps over-interpret some of the change, <clears throat> change of language that you use. So it's well worth being aware of. Yeah. 
And I think also, I mean, we're talking here perhaps more in a sort of clinical context, but actually it's the same with financial as well. Um, I'm not going to name and shame, but there was one particular um, large pharma company that I think one of my analysts once said he had 23 different EPS numbers for, adjusted EPS numbers for. But the finance director still, at every result, used to say, as I told you last time, <laughs> let's introduce another EPS adjustment mm -hmm. number. So uh, you know, it's, it's not just the, the clinical stuff. No. And I think this industry where expectation management is such an important part to, for all audiences, but you know, financial audiences, and, and many companies in the sector won't you know, have the um, luxury of reporting EPS because they're not profitable. Um, therefore, expectation management is set around other criteria. So, but there are the, you know, there are financial factors still. Absolutely, cash runways. You know what people would expect from a licensing deal. What sort of royalty numbers? All those sorts of things Absolutely. come into play. So, so you know, again, consistency of language around that. Yeah. yeah, perfect. All right, Martin, do we have any questions? Yeah, we've got one question. Um, do you think positive and significant as as phrases are overused? And uh, I suppose are people consistent in the way they use those phrases? Who'd like to take that one first? Um. I think positive, sorry, this is Bruffer, I think the positive and significant uh, can be overused. I think it's fine to use significant when you're talking purely about data um, because you can quantify it. Positive is a, is a more, is a trickier one. Um, I, I, you certainly shouldn't use positive if you've missed a primary endpoint, for example. But, um, you know, we've got to allow a little bit of sunshine into these things. Um, so I don't I don't get too worried about positive as, as long as it actually is. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's a good point. That, that uh, don't overuse so that um, you know that trust be, can be maintained. So that when someone sees the word positive, they can trust you that actually it really is positive, um, and it isn't the sort of uh, tertiary endpoint that was positive and, and the primary endpoint wasn't. So that's really important. So. Um, I'd say shy away from using significant if it doesn't mean statistical significance. Mm, yeah. I think that's one where you could really uh, unintentionally uh, suggest something that isn't true. Yes, yes, yes. I think in a scientific setting, significance has, has a, a very specific has a meaning. Significant meaning. So, um, yes, exactly. And also think about your audience because you're not just talking to an audience who understands what a statistically significant outcome is. Mm. You're talking to some cases, uh, you know, uh, some some, you know, uh, an elderly guy that, that has put, you know, bought 20 shares um, and will will be screening the news sites at 9:30, wondering why the share price has gone up or down. Um, so, so you need to be able to explain that that p-value means x or y. Um, and then if you want to go into more detail, as Brough said, stick it in the appendix. It, it, it can be brought out in more detail. It doesn't have to be in the top three paragraphs of your of your press release. You do need to put some of those numbers in, but you don't need to um, overwhelm the press release with um, you know statistics that people won't necessarily understand. Mm, thank you. And I think given positive and significant do have firm meanings. There are other words you can use that um, you know, encouraging doesn't have a scientific meaning per se. So, um, um, you know, words like that. So any others, Martin, or should we move on? No, we can move on. Sue. Perfect. All right. Um, so I think the, the third principle that we were going to discuss was fair, balanced and understandable. Um, and uh, Bruff, I know you were going to kick off with uh, a discussion on this one. Yeah, I mean, I think, to be fair, we've, we've covered a, a little bit of this already, but um, it, it's again, it's about talking about being simple at the top end of the um, release and, and uh, putting the complexity near the bottom, so sort of layering your release, if, if you like. Um, and the other point that uh, one of my traders made, which is quite interesting, was talking about how you talk about the secondary endpoints, because obviously we said at the beginning whether it's a, a, a positive Sorry, not positive. Whether it has attained its primary endpoint or not. Um, but um, also, I mean, we should have some sort of thought about how we deal with secondary endpoints. You know, has it met two out of the three secondary endpoints? Some, some, some quick reckoner. 
one of the things is, is that, again, it's, it's about not liking surprises. So quite often, you know, uh, other people will have a slightly different view on how they feel the stock did, or sorry, how the, how the trial did. And so you want to make sure that people understand that, yes, there was one secondary endpoint they didn't hit. It may, not, it may be relatively irrelevant. Um, but you know it's still good to know that and it's good to have it have it actually in the release somewhere. Um, but I think that's about all I wanted to say on that. Mm. I think one of the things we brought out in the guide was, you know, if you're honest and provide a link to the clinical trial site from the, the very first release you do about that trial, and then in every other release, it makes it very easy for um, you know either the, the, the city or, or any other recipients of that release to click through, and then if they're not quite sure what primary, secondary, tertiary endpoints are, and, and actually what you set out to do in the trial, then you know it's quite complicated to read the whole thing. But it it's quite a good way of, of being honest about things, and uh, and then it, it provides a route for people to click through and, and find what secondary endpoints meant and what, what they meant to you at the time that you filed the trial. So, um, Chris, you're nodding. I think it's a very, a very good suggestion yeah. you know, to have it in that table form on the clinical trial registry. is uh, It's not something you're going to want to do with the release, but yeah. it, it's just Just a click through. Yeah. There. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Liz, did you have anything you wanted to, to add? I think we have covered quite a few points on this. They, they all sort of blend into each other. But... Yeah. No, I think definitely... Um, the points that have been brought up have been particularly um, particularly useful, but there, I think you just have to be aware that sometimes the tone uh, can be a little misleading. So you can say, you know, we're very pleased with X happening, that we had good safety. Well, that might not be what people are actually looking for. You might be looking for an efficacy endpoint. Mm -hmm. So don't be very pleased about something that maybe isn't relevant to whether or not you need to take that product through to the next phase. Be satisfied with safety, um, but then, if, you know, if you're not going to be talking about it again or stopping the trials, then it's yeah. somewhat irrelevant. Yeah, so I think think very hard of, of those individual words and their individual meaning and nuances of the meaning and, and mm -hmm. make sure you're not misleading by um, bringing in words that um, can be interpreted in, in a, a less than positive way. So, Okay, Martin, do we have any questions? Uh, we've got one question about um, non-written communications, actually, with, uh, I guess, investors and other um, stakeholders. Does the panel have any tips on how to maintain clear and consistent messaging to those um, through those communication routes. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're thinking presentations, face-to-face, -face, et cetera. So. Yeah, I suppose phone calls to the analysts on the day of release or something. Yes, yes. Perhaps you must be on yeah. the end of such uh, verbal communication. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's a question of sort of how to stick to the release without, you know, Boring the your listeners to, to death, um, but um, I think that uh, yeah, you have to remain very very consistent with that. Um, you'll quite often find that actually, um, to Chris's point, they quite often have a question about why some language has changed. So that's the sort of most uh, asked. So oh, so now you're saying this. Does that mean that, you know that X or Y is or isn't happening? And and you so say there's quite a lot of times sort of um, clearing up things that they feel have been inferred or implied but haven't been. Um, also, again, which is another sort of reason why one wants to be as clear as possible. Um, but I think the, the, the trick is to sort of keep in the back of the mind the bare bones of, of what you have released um, and obviously not, not em embroider that too much, but maybe go into detail where necessary and, and um, you know, sort of uh, feel that um, you give them satisfactory answers. Thank you. I think that comes back to Chris's point as well, as well earlier about preparation. Because yeah. I think you could, you know, I see a lot of companies carefully craft the written word um, and, and you know sweat over every word, and you actually have to rehearse it coming out of your mouth. I think writing something down and speaking something are two very different things. And you know, having a well prepared Q and A and a well prepared script is one thing, but actually practicing it verbally because you can trip up. You know, something that that looked very comfortable on a piece of paper doesn't actually flow comfortably when you try and talk but, about but points. Pulling the analyst over the wall helps as well. Yeah. 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 I was just going to 
talk about actually financials um as in you know somebody who's been on the end of this um finding out that i've got one set of earnings numbers because maybe the guidance wasn't particularly uh, strong from the finance director and then finding that my peers have very markedly different earnings numbers suggests to me often that, that the finance director wasn't necessarily engaged in the communications as much uh, and and has been briefing somewhat differently or not necessarily for for any negative reason but just not clearly communicating that a number might be very far out, very inconsistent. Now, for instance, BTG always releases uh, a revenue range, which helps really helps analysts to clearly work out where they are um, financially. Uh, and but you can do that because obviously your bigger business has got quite good visibility. Uh, but for really any company, they, there's no reason why you can't give clear guidance on the financials to the analysts. Thank you. Okay, we just need to move along because we're getting close to the end now. So um, I think on the fourth principle, we wanted to um, touch on thinking about all of the publics um, who are recipient of the news. Um, and I know you, you, you've got a good point, Chris, about um, you know the media used to be the, the, the trusted intermediary, but but the speed of communications and the directness these days. Yeah, that's right. We, we call it a press release because it used to go to the press. It used to have a, a, a trained or experienced, uh, knowledgeable reporter who was the, the intermediary, and um, that's not the case anymore. I mean, for one, that, that probably isn't true to say that of the reporters <laughs> sometimes who are covering these press releases, but also you know, they all end up online. They're all in Google searches, Google News. They get syndicated in various you know, news outlets. Uh, who, who just re released the release itself, and so I think you do need to think about everybody as being an audience for that mm -hmm. for that release. Um, and I think um, around patient groups in particular, I mean, this is really I think one of the important ones where uh, your news can really have an impact on people that that you need to be mindful of. Um, having a relationship with patient groups and patient advocates is um, it's, it's very valuable, um, and I think. It's valuable across the life of the product and the life of the portfolio of the company. Um, they can you know, help you with your trial recruitment. They can help you. Uh, Braff was mentioning an example earlier of, of where they can help you with regulatory approval. They can help you with market access. Um, I think these days the relationship is much better between industry and patient groups, and they can help in ways that uh, you know, some of our audience might not appreciate. They're, they're playing a much bigger role in trial design these days uh, and helping to, to validate some of the measures we use for things like quality of life and different patient reported outcomes. So they're really valuable. I think the risk is you, you know, folks who work in a corporate environment or a marketing team or an R&D team, you know, all the things I mentioned there, they, they can be put on a timeline. You know, they can be a point in time or they can be a line on a budget. And patient groups don't work like that. You, know, you can't sort of buy them like you do a CRO. <laughs> you've got to have a relationship that's longer term and you've got to start it before you need it. So I think, um, yeah, just a very basic piece of advice would be to uh, think about who the people are uh, who will ultimately benefit from your, your product, um, the people who you might want to work with to raise awareness about a disease, um, get in touch before you, know, before you need to, and, and, and build those relationships for the long term and for the right reasons. And then I think once you have those relationships, when the piece of news does come along, you're in a much better position to be open with them, um, to be honest with them. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you have good or bad news, there certainly will be people out there who stand to make or lose millions of pounds. And that's probably feels very significant. But for the person out there where that news is their hope, you know, it's their mm -hmm. quality of life, it's their life full stop. Um that's a that's a much more significant impact that your news is going to have, and you need to be uh, doing what you can to manage expectations around that. And I think that really brings in the concept of engagement rather than just communication. I mean, we've called this a communications guide, but but I think the the, the depth of engagement that you need to have in the sector is is uh, is important. So I'm, cons I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, I know we have a question uh, related to um, communication at the 
uh, preclinical stage and, and uh, should you uh, speak to patient groups then? And I think, uh, you know, it's something we will consider and, and we'll get back to that on, on the Q&A that we'll post afterwards. So um, we were going to co cover social media just as a tip, but I think that really wraps into everything we've been talking about in terms of speed of communication, the, the way that news over Google or other um, social or online mechanisms reaches people in a very fast way these days. Um, so perhaps if I can just ask each of the panelists um, in wrapping up to, um, against any of the points or social media or anything we've not covered, one final thought for the audience that they'd last to, like to pass on before we close. Um, uh, Chris, shall I take off with you? Well, all I was going to say was, that, you know, thank goodness none of the Kardashians are interested in commenting on the bar tech. <laughs> <laughs> We're in reasonably safe hands there. And, and Chris? Uh, I, I, I shared a quote earlier from Eisenhower who said, um, you know, planning, plans are useless, planning is invaluable. There's another quote from the, the boxer, Mike Tyson. He says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And, <laughs> you know, so I think, uh, yeah, it's just another way to say I think it's useful to have that plan before uh, before things are very unexpected. When I thought about that ASCO example you gave earlier, uh, that is that was absolutely a punch in the face moment and some companies had a plan. <laughs> yeah, plan B and C. Yeah. <laughs> Liz? I was just going to say don't forget you've got multiple audiences. You've got patient groups, you've got um, large investors, uh, you've got the brokers and, the, and those sort of people. You've got the, the general press. And you've got small investors. So just remember, you've got a huge number of different patient groups who are all going to read the same piece of communication. Thank you. Address them. Well, thank you uh, for everyone who's uh, been on the line listening, and thank you for uh, the panelists for their uh, very useful communication. Obviously, there's the, the guide itself, which I'm sure you'll, you'll all take away and read as bedtime reading. So, Martin, shall I pass over uh, and you close the call today? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you to all of our panelists and to you, Sue, for chairing. I'd just like to highlight a few events that we have coming up, and particularly the uh, UK CEO and Investor Forum on the 23rd and 24th of May. Um, that is obviously an event um, that we'll be talking about the issues we've been talking today um, and much wider discussions about investment in the sector and how you can access uh, finance for your company. So thank you, everyone, and I will close the webinar here. Thank you for listening.